this is Derek from ScreamingGoldAirsoft.com and today what we are doing is we're doing another game review of a miniature war game. This is a Napoleonics miniature war game and as you know I'm an avid uh, tabletop miniature war gamer and Napoleon's Battles is one of my favorite if not the favorite miniatures game that I that I own and I play. Alright now um, I'm going to do a review of the game and I'm going to explain the rules a little bit to you and then in follow-up videos I have a I have a battle report of a game that we played just this last weekend and uh, this battle report might go on for more than two or three videos the game lasted pretty long I'm gonna, I think it was like five or six hours we played this game so what I'm gonna try to do is edit out some of the junk so you get to just see us playing. The battle just happens to be French versus Prussians. Alright, uh, let's talk about Napoleon's Battle. Uh, let's talk about my history with Napoleon's Battles. Napoleon's Battles looks like this, okay? It comes in a, what they called, a, in the in the 80s, they called this a bookcase game. You could slide this in your bookcase, and it had a book on how to play the game with the rules, and then it also came with a secondary book explaining the armies of the Napoleonic period what their uniforms looked like, and how to build a Napoleonic uh, miniature army. It also had some counters, some counters that you could use uh, in place of miniatures, or you could actually base your miniatures on those counters. That would be your initial starting set of bases. And if you look at the back of this box, these are the miniature bases, and this is a uh, an example of a terrain battlefield. And this was an Avalon Hill game. Avalon Hill is no longer with us. Uh, Avalon Hill... Uh, published a magazine called The General. Uh, in The General there were some updates to the rules and some additional scenarios and then they also printed two additional scenario books so there was somewhere in the neighborhood of 36 scenarios um, I, I'm, don't quote me on that number but there was about that many scenarios for Napoleon's battles ranging from the very first battles where Napoleon is not even in charge all the way up to the last battles of, you know, the Hundred Days Battles, Waterloo and all that. Woohoo! Well, the back is right set up for me. Okay, there's nothing in this box because what I did was I took all those books and uh, I cut them down the spine and put them in sheet protectors and put them in a three ring binder and I was using them like that for many, many, many years. This game came out, uh, yeah, sometime in the 80s it came out because I was playing this game in probably 85, 86. I was playing this game and I, I would go to conventions and run this game and uh, people would enjoy it. And my miniature collection was geared around Waterloo. I picked up a bunch of miniatures uh, to play Waterloo. Um, this game is designed to be played in 15 millimeter. But I said, why can't I play this in 172nd? Because you can get 172nd plastic Napoleonic figures super cheap, and it would be a lot less expensive than lead. But what I found was, due to my space being limited in different houses, apartments, or whatever, I found that playing the grand battles that Napoleon's Battles tries to simulate, like Waterloo, I needed a large table when it comes to 172nd. So I went... I switched from 172nd to 15 millimeter. I currently have every figure needed to play Waterloo, plus I have a lot of other figures to play other battles, but mainly my focus was Waterloo, and I think I am 99% finished painting, painting them. I, uh, I think I've got one or two more brigades to go, and I will be completely done painting them my my Waterloo collection. Uh, and yes, I hand painted every one of my figures. I don't, I don't contract out for someone else to paint my figures. Okay, that's just me. When Avalon Hill went down, the rights were sold to, I can't tell you who, maybe the owner or the designer of the game, I don't know, but he sold it again to another company who printed out Napoleon's Battles 2. Napoleon's Battles 2 is not a change of any rules. It is just a clarification of some rules. They tried to throw in, basically tweak the rules, okay? So it is good to have Napoleon's Battles 2 to make, because you might understand a rule better by reading it, but it's widely believed that those rules are no good because they're hard to understand. The way they were written, I think it was done in a hurry is the problem. Uh, they're mixed up. They're not in a good order. Not like the old Avalon Hill system. Avalon Hill was extremely good on uh, organizing their rule sets. And this second company 
just wasn't that good at doing it. So that, that company failed because, uh, because those rules weren't, weren't really accepted. People were still going back and playing the old Avalon Hill set. And you can still find these Avalon Hill sets floating around out there on eBay or whatever. And if you can get your hands on a copy of this, I recommend doing it. Even if you play the newest set, I recommend getting that. I mean, hell, it's got some good scenarios in it. And uh, it's got those counters and templates. But just recently, Lost Battalion Games came out with Napoleon's Battles 3. Man, this box is heavy. Okay, it came out with Napoleon's Battles 3. This box comes with a lot of stuff. You can see it's a little bit bigger than this box, right? I mean, it's like half again as thick, uh, maybe, uh, you know, it's just a little bit bigger box. Kind of the same concept. And then it has a sleeve you take off. Inside the box, there's the rule book. Now this rule book is, first of all, it's written in bigger font. It's twice as thick as this book. It's written in, but it's not any more detailed or more complicated. It is just, the print is just twice as big. So for us old timers, old, old grognards that uh, have been playing this game since the 80s, it makes it easier for us to read, right? So we don't have to break out our reading glasses and go, hmm, even though I still break out my reading glasses when I read anyway. Okay, uh, and what did they do? They went back to the old system of numbering, and they kept the same pictures and diagrams in it. They added a few other pictures, and, you know, like, you know, just like that. Because that, that book was not in color at all. And then, uh, and they make it easier to read, you know? This game, this, this booklet's just a little bit easier to read. Um, it's more visually appealing. In the box, you get templates. You get uh, scenarios. Now the scenarios are done up in individual sheets. You get like a little three ring, a little ring to put all your scenarios in. But you get a scenario, right? And I've got a few extra scenario expansions for this. But you get a scenario. Like this, this scenario is the Battle of Salamanca. Okay, and okay, there's that's another reference card. About the Battle of Salamanca. It's only on a little referee screen type type sheet, right? It has all the units that participated in the game and their stats. It has a map. It tells you a little bit about what's going on in the scenario. All right, and like on the back, you have like victory conditions. This tells you the order of battle and like when units are deployed and where they're deployed on the battlefield. And every one of these scenario cards are written out, laid out exactly the same way. So all you have to do is pull a card out and you can play this battle, right? And they have a number of cards. Like, I've got a ring here, and I've got another ring right there. This is like the first expansion. That's the scenario expansion one. There's three expansions. I need to go ahead and get the expansion two and three. I just went to the website, and I didn't see scenario expansion one on there. I saw two and three. I heard a rumor at the last game that maybe Lost Battalion Games isn't producing this game anymore, but they are selling it on their website, so I might have to jump in and get uh, expansions two and three before they disappear. It comes with a lot of wooden counters, uh, a whole slew of little wooden markers that you can use. Instead of the old cardboard chits that wore out over time, you can use colored wooden uh, cubes that you can put out there. It also comes with a DVD that you can use on your computer to print out your labels. Instead of photocopy, because the old system was you'd have a, 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 label, a label set, you'd photocopy it, cut it out with scissors, and then tape it onto your miniatures. Well, uh, in this one you can just print out the, the page you need and uh, cut it out and tape it. Okay, And it's done a lot differently. The new, the new system is color coded and has symbols so you can quickly identify which units are in which uh, divisions and which brigades and uh, not brigades but uh, cores and uh, it really makes it a, an easier game. So Lost Battalion Games did an awesome job. I think out of all the sets the Lost Battalion Games set is the best out of all three sets that I've had it is the best Napoleon's Battles rule set so far. Well let's talk about the rules a little bit. I'm not going to go into everything, you know, uh, I'm not going to basically teach you the entire game. I'm just going to give you the general gist so that when you're watching the battle report, you're not going like, well, what the hell is he doing? Why is he doing that? Well, the overall concept behind the game is one, you have phases. Like you have your players have turns and each turn is 30 minutes long. You have the 
French turn, and then you have the Allies turn, usually. And in this game, you're going to have the French, and which have allies, like Italians and Wurttembergers, and then you're going to have the Prussians, and the Prussians are going to, you know, have their turn, and the French have their turn, and you go back and forth. And when the French complete a turn, and the Prussians complete their turn, that is 30 minutes of time. And so we learn that the game lasts, and what you can use is, like, a clock right here, and you can move this counter up and down the clock telling you exactly what time of day it is. It's every, and like scenarios will start at like 7 o'clock and they'll end at like 1400, and so you move your counter along as you go, and that way you know what turn it is, you know what scenario uh, specific events happen, like uh, reinforcements, things like this. So it's done in turns. And in your turn, you have phases. Those phases are command phase, and that's usually when you do your rallying and you determine that everybody's in command. That is the primary thing that makes Napoleon's battles uh, unique, is that it has this command and control uh, ish, uh, system where you have your overall commander. Your overall commander is in command. He has a radius, okay? And then his secondary commanders have... Uh, they have to be inside that radius. And when they're inside that radius, they are in command. And then they individually have a smaller, much smaller command radius. And as long as their subordinates are within it, then so it's like a long chain of command all the way up to the main guy. If anybody is outside of that command, because tables are much bigger than your generals have command to control. So if you have a general that's trying to flank way out on the side, what he has to do is he has to roll his command and control number. And if, it's called a response number. And if he can do that, then he gets to move. Otherwise, he moves. if he's cavalry, he moves slow. And if he's uh, infantry, he doesn't move at all. So uh, if he makes the roll, infantry moves half and cavalry moves full speed. So you want to keep your infantry units in command so that they get to move. And your cavalry units, if you want to risk it, you can send them out to the flanks. They might or might not be able to move. Usually, your command uh, commanders that command cavalry divisions have a higher response number because they basically were given authority to run their own divisions the way they wanted, right? So, or uh, independently, usually. So they have like sevens. Everything in this game is run on D10s. Not a percentile roll, not 2D6, not a D12 or D20. It's D10. So every time you make a roll, you roll 1D10. That's all it is. You just always roll 1D10. So all you need is 1D10 to play the game. But it's good to have every player have his own D10. You got your units on the table. They're both on there. They're both deployed. Everybody's in. And then you measure your command spans. You determine that everybody's in command. And once you've determined everybody's in command, then you go ahead and move. The next step, step is movement. So I'm just going to say, hypothetically, let's say it's the French turn. Well, the French player goes about moving each one of his blocks of units. He's got like four figures glued on a base. That is a stand. Okay, these stands are grouped together to form brigades. Okay, these brigades, usually somewhere between four to six stands, always stay together. They never break apart or move around. That is a block of troops. Depending on how they are set up, either uh, one line in the front and one line in the back of stands, that would be a column. Okay, it's a combat column. Um, if you put them all on the same row or same line, that is called line formation. And then if you put them all single file, one behind the other, that is called march column. And those are the only formations that you need to concern yourself with. I mean, there is square. That's where the back rank just turns around and faces backwards. What that simulates is every little... Um, Every little company or every little regiment inside the battalions are all forming squares. And so there's a ton of these little squares inside the area that your brigade's miniatures are taking up. Okay, so if you're looking at an inch at about 100 yards, um, and if a base is about an inch long, then a brigade in column is 200 yards long. Okay, and it would be about, I don't know, about 200 yards wide, okay, approximately. And that and will handle like six stands. Each stand is about 480 guys, men. So how many guys is that? Do the math and how in a big area. You know, they're all shoulder to shoulder, back to back, 
clumped up, right? Okay, now to determine movement, every type of unit has a unique stat sheet, okay? So if you pulled out your scenario, right, and we're just gonna use, I don't know. If you pulled out your stat, your scenario card and take a look at it, let's talk about French line at Salamanca, okay? They can move 10 inches in column, three inches in line, and 18 inches in march column. And every unit has their own unique movement characteristics. Plus, there's modifiers for moving in rough, or moving sideways, or changing formation, things like that. All that's in movement. You take your figures and you move them. And there are different ways to move them. There's a whole chapter on how to move your figures. You might have to wheel them and then move. You can echelon up to 45 degrees. You know, you can move backwards, you can move sideways, you can change formations, all that good stuff. Once you're done moving, then it goes into the firing phase. The firing phase always takes place with the defender. The defender gets to shoot first, so the Prussians would shoot at the French. We'd roll all of our dice, we determine all of our casualties, then it would be the French offensive fire. So the French would fire all of his guys, shooting at the front, at the Prussians or whoever, and that would be the end of the fire phase. During the firing phase, when a unit is firing at someone, you have to determine that they're in range, because every unit has a different range and it's on their stat sheet. Every unit has a different modifier to their die roll, that's on the stat sheet. So you look at French line, you say, okay, they have a six inch range and it's a plus zero to the die roll. Okay, so he's rolling a die and he's adding zero, so that's pretty easy. You just roll a die, that's the number. The defender always just rolls a die. When it comes to shooting, the defender just rolls a die. It's never modified. And so you take the modified attacker's roll versus the defender's roll. If he beats that roll, he does one hit. So one figure is killed. If he does double his number, like if I rolled a two and you rolled a modified four, then you do two hits to me, and that's all shooting can do. Shooting can do one or two hits. If you successfully kill four figures, then you pick up the stand and you put it away. Every unit has a disperse, uh, I'm sorry, a disorder number and a route number. If, let's say, a unit has a disorder number of two, and you successfully shoot me and do two points of damage, then that unit becomes disordered, and you mark it. And that's the way that works. Now, if you have two units shooting at me, let's say, and one unit does two, and the other unit also does two, and my route number is four, my unit would actually route uh, back, you know, back and have to be routed to be able to be functioned later. And that's, the, that's, that's shooting. Then we would go into melee phase. The melee phase would only happen if two brigades touch. If units are touching, okay, they can be touching on the side, the rear, face to face, they could be, you know, they could have hit like at a corner or something like that. However, the bases are touching another enemy unit's bases, then there is a melee. And now melee is determined by an opposed die roll. I roll a die, you roll a die, just like shooting. Except this time, the defender gets modifiers to his die roll. Attacker also gets modifiers to his die roll, and both of these modifiers are determined by what kind of formation you're in. So if you're in a line formation, you get pluses, and if you're in a column formation, you get minuses. If you're in a march column, you get huge minuses. And um, if you're cavalry attacking infantry that's not in a square, you get huge pluses. And if you're in a square defending against cavalry, you get huge pluses, and blah, 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 blah. So there's a, there's a chart. It's only about 10 or 15 possible different modifiers. And you can almost memorize, I have memorized, all the modifiers. Then you compare the rolls. And whoever rolled higher wins, obviously. He rolls a 1, but he gets a plus 1, so now he has a 2. But this guy rolled a 3, and he has a plus 3, so now he's got a 6. So that 6 to 2 is a victory. And that you take the difference, which is 4, 6 minus 2, he just did four casualties to that guy. And because he did four casualties, you can just go ahead and pick up a base because each casualty kills one figure. So the four figures is a stand, so you pull that off. And then you com compare the casualties to his response, not his response, his disorder or his route number. And if he hits a route number, then that unit routes. Now because the attacking unit won the fight, caused them to route or blow up, then he would have to take a winner loss. Okay, so he actually takes a casualty. 
I think that's supposed to represent um, guys surrendering on the other side, maybe, and some of your guys have to take prisoners and guard them, or maybe, even though you won, you still lost somebody, you know, so you did lose some casualties, even if you did crush them, you know, and that's the way melee works, and then you advance forward. Now, cavalry have this thing, they have to recall their guys, so when they do a casual, when they do casualties to their enemy, if they blow them up or whatever, the cavalry has to try to make a recall. The com cavalry commander is trying to reorganize cavalry because they're all running around like lunatics. And he's trying to reorganize them, reorganize them. And if he succeeds, then he gets to move later in the turn or react to an attack uh, from the other side. If he fails, then he has to charge out even again and attack the next unit. And if he does that, he's considered disordered because they're all just mingled up and he attacks the next unit and he gets and he's disordered and disordered units don't fight well. All right, there's a few other phases thrown in there that I'm not going to talk about. It's not important. But um, you have like a pursuit phase and some other Okay. And then this turn flips over to your opponent's turn and then he gets to rally his guys, check his command, move his guys, then you shoot, he shoots, do melee, next turn. Simple. It's it's super simple. You check command, move your guys, both sides shoot, you do melee, end of turn. All right, I hope I didn't bore you with the details of how you play the game. I didn't really get you into too many details. But now watch these next few videos that I'm going to upload. This is of a game that Mike, Tom, Tom was running the game. Mike uh, was playing the French and Allies, and I was playing the Prussians. I was on the attack. It was in Württemberg. It's a very small scenario. The scenario is one core against a core. And uh, it was pretty, it was a good game. It was fun. Yeah, I enjoyed it. I had a good time. Um, so check out those videos. I'm going to try to edit out the, uh, you know, conversations between terms and stuff and stick to just us playing the game. And then uh, let's see if, see uh, who wins.